Okay. Good. It's recording. So let's start. It's very nice to have today Andrea Moretti from Università di Genova and INFN, who will tell us about holography, hydrodynamics, and condensed matter experiments. Please, Andrea, go ahead. Okay. So thank you for the invitation and thank you for organizing this nice meeting in these difficult times. So uh, the point of my talk is actually to answer this question. So when I was following for the first time the hydro course in the bachelor, the professor told me about this possible analogy between a, a, an electric circuit and uh, a circuit made by pipes and, uh, and pumps. And actually I was finding this analogy fa very fascinating, but uh, actually, I discovered with sadness that this analogy is not really, is mostly always wrong. And uh, the reason why the analogy is wrong is that uh, the, while in a metal electrons are moving uh, and uh, scatters uh, with a lattice and dissipates energy like, with a, with a, due to the presence of a lattice, in uh, water, water in the pipes, uh, dissipates energy because or because of uh, viscosity, because of internal friction. So, but uh, so my question is: but uh, are there system where uh, this analogy can be true without cheating? So, can we actually tell to bachelor students that this analogy is indeed true, at least in some system, without cheating? Uh, so, this is what my my talk is aim to and uh, what i want I, I will focus is electron system in condensed matter and actually we know that electron system are uh, give uh, rise to many different phases in natures and uh, many different uh, interesting phases uh, and um, uh, so the and uh, actually we have uh, not a lot of way to actually tackle and analyze these phases one of the most uh, common to use is to measure the electric resistivity. And actually, uh, there is a very well uh, known and uh, very successful model uh, uh, described by Drude in actually more than 100 years ago, uh, which described the motion of uh, electrons in a, in, a, in a solid within a lattice. And uh, uh, so this model is called the Drude model. And the resistivity takes this particular form where the scattering of the, the dissipation rate is given by this one over tau and is the mean free path of electrons uh, in, uh, in, 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 in a lattice. Actually, so there are, um, if one goes uh, to study uh, condensed matter books like solid state physics, uh, like by Ashcroft and Mermi, they discover that this scattering mechanism is. Uh, a composite scattering mechanism and is uh, um, depending on the region of the phase diagram in which you are, it might be uh, given by different scaling in temperature. Uh, the point is that in normal material, in normal metals, in normal uh, room temperature, the electron electron scattering, so the friction of electron between the sense, is typically not really important for this process. So the resistivity is uh, almost never governed by internal frictions of electrons. So then, uh, um, but, uh, and the reason why this is uh, the case is because the electrons in a solid organize uh, with a so-called Landau's Fermi liquid theory, which was discovered by Landau in 46. And uh, basically they organize into a Fermi surface and uh, the Fermi, sur the excitation around the Fermi surface are, long, are typically long lived uh, uh, excitation called quasi particles. And this quasi-particle interacts very weakly be between each other. So in normal metals, the transport uh, are determined by the quasi-particles, which are weakly interacting, uh, uh, longly degrees of freedom. But uh, actually, there are systems in which this might be not true, and this is actually the, the, the major part of the, of the talk. And uh, in this system, I will try to, I try to argue that the hydrodynamic might be uh, a sensible theory uh, to, to, describe, to describe the transport properties of this material. So what is hydrodynamic? I know many people in the audience are experts in this case, in these fields, but just to recall, uh, hydrodynamics is 
and effective field theory where the fundamental degrees of freedom are not the quasi-particles like uh, in the Fermi liquid theory, but are conserved quantities like momentum, energy, and charge. So uh, in order for this to be, to be the case, so in order for this to have, to, for these degrees of freedom to be the only uh, sensible degrees of freedom, uh, the regime in which hydrodynamic works is, uh, uh, the, is when uh, the length time scales is much larger than the microscopic ones. So in, uh, in, in systems that are strongly coupled, this is exactly what happens. So uh, you, the quasi, in, a, in a strongly coupled system where, where the quasi-particle description is not any more valid, you don't have a micro, any more uh, uh, well-defined long lived quasi, um, fundamental uh, microscopic degrees of freedom. But uh, of course, you still have uh, the uh, degrees of freedom which are conserved, which are the momentum energy in charge. So actually, hydrodynamic uh, is uh, in the strongly coupled regime, uh, the ideal uh, uh, effective field theory to describe, uh, to, to, to describe the properties of a material in a strongly, in a strongly coupled regime. So if one uh, tried to search uh, about people that before uh, uh, tried to describe a solid, the transfer property behaviors uh, of solids uh, with uh, hydrodynamics, uh, actually the, you find that the first attempt were pretty early, it was in 1968, eight, the first, and uh, but actually there were actually more even more uh, uh, attempts. Uh, in particular, there is one by Yaji in, in 1980, where he really tried to apply Navier-Stokes fundamental Navier-Stokes equation uh, to the to describe the electric resistivity of um, of, a, of, of a metal uh, depend, and trying to find uh, the effects of changing the shape uh, of uh, of a system, like uh, describing a, either a plate in this case, or uh, a, 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 like a wire in, in this case, and modifying either the sides, the, the radius of the, of the wire or the sides of the plate. So it was actually trying to he, he really uh, solve another Stokes equation in this case, trying to describe the fundamental degrees of freedom and comparing the electric resistivity. And that was the results, the experimental results that he tried to, to compare with. So, which I think is pretty, already pretty, a pretty inaccurate uh, description. Um, so, but actually, I mean, after 1995, actually, the application of hydro to to, to describe strongly coupled system wasn't really discussed anymore, for at least not intensively. But there was a revival uh, uh, with the came of holography, and in particular, in 2005. Uh, in uh, where when uh, Cogton, Son, and Starrison described this the well-known bounds of uh, E over S, they found that uh, holographic systems are actually uh, respecting a bounds of the uh, shear viscosity over the entropy density, and this bound was, is very particular is one over four pi h bar over, over the Boltzmann constant Kb, and so the the important thing was that uh, these bounds was actually uh, discovered to be valid or close to be valid in a real system like the quark form plasma. And actually, uh, it was lately uh, discovered to be valid in other systems. Uh, the important point is that the more the system is strongly coupled, the more this bound is supposed to be valid. So if one finds system in which E over S is close to saturate this bound, there is an indication that the system uh, might be strongly coupled and that the, your electron system might be described by hydro either in a proper way. So in the meanwhile, there has been an intense uh, theoretical effort in describing a system with uh, uh, holographic and electrodynamic system with, uh, with uh, in uh, you were describing materials uh, in general materials here I, I i i was citing something i'm sorry if i missed some names but there were a lot and uh, this in part, uh, most importantly this theoretical effort was uh, followed by an in by also a, a, an experimental activity in which people uh, started to 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 catch uh, things to 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 try to really think if uh, uh, hydro, hydrodynamic can be really uh, a, a proper description of, uh, 
of, so, of, of, of electron systems. And in particular, you see this activity is very recent. I'm citing papers by one year or two years ago. So it's a field that is ongoing and I think is a sensible question to ask, even because hydro is or holography are basically one of the few theoretical tools we have to describe strongly coupled system nowadays. So what I, what I will try to tell you is my small contribution to the story. And uh, in particular, what I, what I tried to do is to try to see if the transport properties of uh, one of the most famous uh, category of uh, strongly coupled uh, condenser metal systems, the high TC superconductors, and in particular the cuprates, are well described by a hydrodynamic theory. So just to let you know what are in general the cuprates, uh, these uh, systems are uh, called either ITC superconductors or cuprates because uh, they, are, they are like skyscrapers of uh, layers of uh, uh, copper oxide, uh, which are uh, intertwined in, with a rare hair, which uh, sits in the, between one, uh, one, one layer and another. So this is a crystal of uh, one of the sample that uh, we have used in our work to, which is called the BISCO. And uh, these are, these are free, of course, 3D materials, 3D crystals, but uh, all the exotic properties, and in particular, the, the high temperature superconductivity phenomena happens in plane, so in the CO2 plane. And so, and in particular, uh, these properties seem to be so universal that uh, actually the existence of this copper oxide plane is supposed to be the, the reason why all this, this material have this high temperature superconductivity and all this peculiar property, which I'm going to uh, briefly describe later. And uh, the reason why we have been uh, using this uh, particular sample, the B2201, is because uh, these, ma we are, uh, these material are, uh, as the name says, high temperature superconductors. So they, uh, they, they are famous because they are, uh, they, they, they they became super, become superconductors at relatively high temperature. But we don't want this temperature to be too much high because actually we want to study the normal properties of these materials. So we, we want the system which was an IPC superconductor, so which was strongly coupled, but in which we could uh, analyze the normal properties of these materials without being a too high temperature where lattice phenomenon might, might be the most relevant uh, transport phenomenon. So the BE2201 is one of the C few, is, a, is an high temperature superconductor whose uh, critical temperature is uh, pretty low, at optimal doping is around 11, 15 Kelvin. So it's ideal to tackle the property, the normal properties of this material while being uh, at low temperature. So as I said, these uh, material are, uh, famous to have a very generic, despite the fact that they have a very different uh, uh, crystal structure between each other, uh, they, are, they have a, a pretty similar uh, uh, phase diagram. In particular, there is, uh, this is the phase diagram of temperature against all doping. The whole doping is basically uh, proportional to the career density, in, in plane career density, in plane, I mean, when I, I, say, I say in plane, in plane I mean, uh, the density of carriers uh, in, the, in the copper oxide plane. And uh, at very low doping, there is a very well known antiferromagnetic phase. Then there is the so called pseudo gap phase, which is characterized to be with some property of the, with, with the depression of electric conductivity at low frequency, which is called indeed pseudo gap. Then uh, the superconductive dome starts here. And there is a point called the optimal doping point, which is the point at which the, the, the critical temperature is the highest possible. And the region above this, uh, this, this, uh, this point is called the strand metal phase. So the, and this is exactly the region where we are interested to, to, to analyze properties and is probably the most uh, misunderstood part of, this, uh, of, 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 this, of, of the phase diagram of this material. So well, an interesting point is that uh, it, there is the, um, 
be uh, exactly uh, down uh, at a zero temperature at the op optimal doping point optimal doping point uh, a quantum critical point is supposed to be to affect the properties uh, of material and uh, in particular this quantum critical point is supposed to affect also the property of a strange metal phase above uh, uh, above so uh, it is believed that uh, the 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 the, the, the um, the properties of the strange metal phase are affected by the existence of this hidden quantum critical point, which sit, sits uh, in, uh, in, the super, uh, in the superconductive dome. Andrea, just a short interruption. You are aware that in the last few years, there's a lot of evidence accumulating, demonstrating that there's no quantum critical point. Uh, well, yeah. Uh... No, 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 no. No, no, this has been looked for for about 30 years. Nobody could ever find it. And in the last two, three years, uh, there, you know, it's, it's a variety of data showing that there's no quantum critical point. It's news, right? So the quantum critical point may well be regarded now as folklore from a past, right? It could be for a lot of it because there are quantum critical phases now. There are also the overdose phases, not a thermal liquid or anything of the kind. Right? That's very weird, actually. No. Uh, that landscape has really been changing. You know, I'm the expert, uh, believe me. No, 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 I, I, I believe you, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just take for granted and think like holographer, you're in a good shape. No, no, no I... Uh, Jan? Okay. Yeah. Oh, on, on this note, so what do you make of the measurements by Typhair about the specific heat? Oh, Typhair is making up a lot of stuff. It's really horrible, you know? I think that, uh, uh, you know, you talk with other people that uh, work at Magnet Labs and, uh, you know, they basically consider them as a fraud. I mean... Louis tries to prove that quantum critical point, right? And he's just uh, cherry picking data together. There's one more but, thing. But wait, anything, what, what are you? Anything, uh, wait, please, I'm the expert. Um, anything um, that looks like, you know, diverging mass is all based on uh, these quantum oscillations that you find at extremely low temperature, deep in the superconducting phase in very large magnetic fields. And we know that when you get in the superconductor, right? you restore class particles, blah, blah. Um, so there's really no sign of a specific heat divergences when you look at a specific heat at higher temperatures. There's all mythology. So, so oh, you're saying the log divergence that he... Uh, that's just bullshit. It's something, you know, related to being at uh, 0.5 Kelvin in the fuel of 60 Tesla. Deep in the uh, in the fortis fluid, right? We know it. That's been all along very easy. There's old data by Lorem and Tellen uh, measuring mm -hmm. the specific heat in the space metal phase, right above the superconducting dome. There's nothing to be discerned of, you know, a uh, enhanced specific heat at the optimal dome. The evidence, you know, for uh, this con uh, for for the, this quantum critical phase is much more direct. You know, it's. Uh, really at the interface is photo mission specific heat now and also uh, very new and secret uh, Hall effect measurements. Okay. Thanks. It's good for holographers, you know, we like photo critical faces. I mean, uh, just think that way, but continue. Okay, so uh, well, what is sure is that in the strange metal phase, we, we don't have well-defined quasi-particles and the system is supposed to be strong coupling. So, for, uh, so then uh, um, let me just recall so the, as i said the strange metal phase so the, the the region above this optimal doping point in the normal phase is the region where we focus our attention so let me recall some of the transfer properties that we are commonly known in this uh, in this material so we know that in the fermi liquid at very low temperature um, the the resistivity is supposed to be dominated by the electron electron scattering and so goes scale like t squared in um, t squared and also the whole angle which is the, um, the the ratio between the resistivity in the x direction and the and in the y x y direction is supposed in the fermi liquid to score to to scale like t, like t squared this is not what happens in uh, cuprates where uh, and this is probably the most famous uh, um, the most famous part um, property of this material, the resistivity scales like t, linearly in T for uh, down just just above the, the, the transition between superconductors and normal phase, 
to up very high temperatures. So this is one of the most mysterious uh, property of this material. But on, in contrast, the whole angle is this scaling, scaling like T squared. Uh, well, actually, in uh, in the in our sample, the B two two zero one, the scaling is is known to be t to the one point five, but uh, this won't be very important to what we to what we are going to say. So there are other p other properties of this material which are less known. Some because they are difficult to measure. For example, the the thermal conductivity is typically dominated by lattice vibration. And so it's not really a really easy uh, signal to disentangle from, uh, from, from, the, from the lattice. But uh, there are other measures which are, which are easiest to, to disentangle from the lattice vibration, which are the transverse one, like the nurse, nurse coefficients and the old thermal conductivity. These uh, uh, being transverse uh, transport coefficients, these are uh, typically um, not affected by phone, so they might be a promising uh, quantity to, to, me to, to measure uh, um, and uh, be sh being sure that you're not, you're, not, you're not just seeing lattice vibration. Uh, there is also the magnetic resistance, which is the, the B squared contribution to the conductivity. Uh, this is typically very small because we are typically uh, working uh, at very uh, in a system where the, the, the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, is uh, um, the smallest scale in the system and is typically be suppressed. But it's something that, in principle, you can measure. So I told you about phases, uh, about uh, many, of the, the, about the, the basic properties of the, of the phase diagram of this material. Very recently, it was found that uh, the phase diagram is, is even more complicated. Uh, and in particular, there are uh, orders, uh, charge density wave order that uh, appears through all the, uh, all the phase diagram. And uh, in particular, uh, there, this was an, a paper by Peng in 2018, where uh, we they found that the charge density wave order, which was supposed to be just a property of the low temperature um, region in the underdoped phase, so the, the region at the, at the at the left of the optimal doping point, was actually persisting at optimal doping and was actually recovered even in the overdoped phase. So, uh, what is a charge density wave? Just to, to recall it, a charge density waves was a was a was a, a phase transition which was found actually by a very long time ago by Pyers and it was an instability of a 1D lattice, which was basically uh, where in which electrons were organizing. Uh, he found that there was an instability towards a periodic structures of electron above the periodic structure of the lattice. And uh, actually, these, the, the, the spacing, the, the periodicity of this electron wave was uh, uncommensurate with respect to the under uh, to the um, to the lattice spacing, which was behind. So in this sense, I will speak in what follow about spontaneous or pseudo spontaneous uh, breaking of translation of, ele of electron fluid, because I will uh, consider that these uh, uh, periodic uh, 2D structures that the electron fluid are uh, um, creating above the lattice spacing are uncommensurate with respect to the lattice spacing of the, of the, of the real lattice of the system. Again, a short interruption. Uh, be again aware of the history, right? So uh, it started out in the late eighties, and experiments after this occurred in the in the, in the mid nineties, right? And back then we called it not just density wave because just density wave is explicitly referring to a single harmonic beat coupling phenomenon, right? That's basically what you're saying there. And well, back then we learned that actually uh, you better call it charge order or anything of the kind because it's not at all, you know, a single harmonic weakly coupled phenomenon, right? And that's never changed. However, um, this was only seen in 2004 and then in 2007, uh, it broke also in 123 and 2212 and it had to get a new name, right? And the name Stripes was too much in the uh, 90s. So people started to talk about just dense wave order. I find it still actually a bit annoying because we know from scanning tunnel spectroscopy where you see it directly, it's not at all like a simple pyrus wave. It, it is uh, very anemonic stuff. So it's, it's well, more like a pink, pink, pink crystal. 
it, it's sociology, you know, it, it's, uh, it's such a bad name for what you see. Uh, yeah, okay. I... Right, it's basically for it back to 1950s, my stride from 1987 uh, were a lot more interesting than the pile space from 1950. So how, how do you call them? Uh, I would call it charge order. Okay, let's charge see. crystallization whatsoever, right? It's, 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 the density wave suggests it's an harmonic thing and it's a really horrible abuse of language. And then, then you know, everybody learns about nesting in school and uh, uh, experimentalists feel comfortable with it. But it's really annoying because it works a lot of profanity under the work, but continue. Okay, then let's call them charge order. The, the, the basic idea is that electrons organize in periodic structures yeah, the lattice. it is a charge crystal or it's an electron crystal in essence, right? That is pinned or unpinned. So actually this kind of charge ordering were known since a while with Fukuyama and Lee and Rice in 78, uh, at least the, the basic property of the conductivity. And uh, what they see was that actually as soon as the breaking of the translation becomes not properly spontaneous, but pseudo spontaneous, and this is sort of necessary to have a finite conductivity. Uh, the, the electric conductivity is acquiring this specific, this particular form. And depending on the, on the values of these coefficients here, you might have either a, a sort of a Drude like peak or an Ophatics peak, which was something that actually people were measuring in sort of a, in this kind of system at high temperature in this in a, since a very, even very long time ago. So our point was, uh, can this, all this peculiar phase become uh, be fit in a unique description, especially at, uh, at, uh, at, um, at, at optimal doping? Uh, actually, charge density waves, it was recently so seen that, uh, that uh, the charge order is not only affecting the, the electric conductivity, but even the nurse and the other transport coefficients like the nurse effect is affected by, uh, the, by the charge density, the charge order. And uh, in particular, there was this paper where they found a, a relation between the, char the charge order transition uh, uh, critical temperature and uh, the um, and the announcement of the of the nurse effect. This announcement that you find that low temperature was typically um, attributed uh, originally to fluctuating superconductivity, but in this paper they found that actually the temperature at which uh, these announcement announcements, so this deviation from the Fermi liquid prediction, which is sort of a linear one here, uh, starts is related to the charge uh, order phase uh, critical temperature and is typically to, uh, to twice this temperature. There is this relation here. So they say, they affirm that charge, density, charge order may, aff may affect also the, the nurse signal at, at fluctuating level. So basically, where do we stand? We have a system uh, very complicated with many phases uh, uh, happening at the same time. We have, uh, we have these systems are typically strongly coupled, so we don't have any description, uh, any any quasi description of the system uh, in terms of quasi particles. So uh, we need a, a theoretical methods to start to analyze them, and uh, this is uh, my contribution. So let's see if hydro might help in understanding this picture, and let's see if hydrodynamics might be included in a unified. Uh, the unified picture. And uh, so what we have done uh, together with experimentalists in Dresden and in Genoa was at first to try to, to look only at the DC transfer properties. And in particular, what we, what we, what we did, uh, what they did was to measure uh, uh, five of these uh, transport, DC transfer coefficient uh, well, some of them were very known since a while, even in this system, like the resistivity, which was linear as, uh, as, as, as known. The, the whole angle was measured since a while. Also, probably the magnetic resistance was measured before. Uh, actually, what wasn't really measured with care was, the, uh, was really the thermal oil conductivity in this system, which was something that uh, new that they measure uh, positively and the nurse signal. So let me say that all these, uh, uh, all these uh, transport coefficients have been, have been measured in uh, the same sample, which is something that is not really easy to do, especially because 
the, to, 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 analyze, to, to measure the, the thermal or conductivity, you need uh, some, some, uh, some specific set set up to, and uh, so it's difficult to adapt the sample to, to measure all these all these properties within the same sample. But this is some in some sense the only way in which we can be sure that we are analyzing, we are measuring all these coefficients in the same, exactly the same point of the, of the phase diagram. So the first things we did was to find the proper uh, inter so to, to characterize the, the magnetic field dependence and temperature dependence of the transport coefficients and definitely find the proper uh, uh, interval in which you can, we can be sure that uh, there is only one mechanism appearing in the system. So we, the critical temperature uh, for this system was about uh, around uh, 11 Kelvin. But actually, we found that uh, we couldn't go beyond 20 Kelvin because uh, the nurse coefficients was, uh, which is expected to be, uh, to depend linearly uh, as, the, as the magnetic field is varied, was deviating uh, beyond the 20 K from um, 20 Kelvin from, uh, from the linear behavior, as you can find here in this picture. So, and this is typically, um, is known to be due to vortex effect. So basically what we said is that uh, our data can be valid uh, be above uh, 20, 20 Kelvin. Okay. So another point was uh, to use the fact, uh, uh, the, 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 the work by Sire Crionier to estimate the, the critical temperature of a charge density wave. So we, we measure the nurse at, um, at varying temperature and we found uh, the point in, at which the, um, the nurse was deviating from the linear behavior, which one expects in the, in the standard Fermi liquid. And we found that uh, this charge order critical temperature is estimated to be around 65 Kelvin. So, and this is actually a critical temperature, which was pretty in accordance with the data that we found in, in this paper by Peng, which was actually measuring directly the charge density, the charge order of critical temperature. So uh, then uh, in the relevant uh, um, temperature interval, we, we extracted the, 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 the temperature dependence of the transport coefficient and the result is that one. So uh, as known for the, for the, the resistivity was as expected linear in T, the magneto resistance was scaling like t to the minus four and uh, the all angle was scaling like t to the 1.5 as expected again in this kind of system. The known, the new piece of data was that the, the, the thermal conductivity was scaling like t to the minus three and the nurse effect was scaling like t to the minus 2.5. And the B dependence of this transport coefficient is the one expected for a parity invariant system at least in this interval of temperature. So then what we did is say, okay, we have the data, we need to, to find a proper hydro description for the system with a charge, a charge order. And uh, what we used to do that was the, the usual uh, a bra Poisson bracket method. Basically when uh, you have a fluid and you have some uh, long lived ghost of boson uh, in this fluid, you find uh, what you do is you find the Poisson brackets of the, new degrees of freedom, in this case, the ghost on boson related to translation breaking uh, with the fundamental degrees of freedom that you have already in the fluid. And then uh, you, pro you provide your theory with the uh, modified Hamiltonian due to the ghost on boson and you find the equation of motion uh, for, the mo for the quantity of your system using the usual uh, uh, Eisenberg equation. So in the case of the phone, of the, of the phone so in, in the case of the, breaking of translation, uh, we have that the, the ghost on boson related to the breaking of translation are conjugated to the momentum density. And uh, in a system which is uh, isotropic, uh, like, as in, uh, li li like, like the system they found in this material, you can uh, provide the Hamiltonian for the, for the ghost on boson uh, respecting the symmetry of isotropy in the plane, which is this one. And you can easily find uh, uh, using this Poisson bracket, the equation of motion, the relevant modification to the equation of motion of your quantities, which are this one. Here, I also found a, a small mass for the Boston boson, which means that the, the translation are not 
uh, spontaneously broken, but uh, explicitly broken or slightly bro explicitly broken. Of course, you need to modify your system, uh, but including uh, other mechanism of momentum dissipation, like, uh, for example, an external a coupling to an external lattice, like momentum, dis a momentum dissipation rate. There is a phase relaxation, which is present as soon as translation are explicitly broken rather than being just spontaneously broken. And of course, since we are measuring uh, system, uh, properties uh, in, a, in an external magnetic field, we also provide the theory with an external magnetic field, which was just uh, implemented as in the standard way. So the modified equation of motion are this one. The only things you need now in order to properly compute the transport coefficient in hydro is uh, to provide the constitutive relation, which actually define your transport coefficients. So, I mean, the, the, the equation are sort of a mess, but these transport coefficients can appears then in the correlators and consequently in the conductivity and in all the transport coefficients that you can measure. And uh, these transport coefficients are bound. Uh, some of, the, of these bounds comes from the entropy production. Uh, entropy production, so the entropy has to be positive. The production has to be positive, and we also constrain the, the system to be uh, to be to be to have a, a sort of relativistic covariance, like like you can find in many holographic fluids. So basically, some of the transport coefficients are related to each other, to the to the, to the in particular, this alpha knot and K knot are related to this, to this sigma knot in this way because of relativistic covariance. Then you just apply the Martin Karanov method and you find the transfer coefficients. So if you restrict to the DC low magnetic field uh, behavior, you find that this is the picture. So here we just started the transfer coefficients that we had before. Um, sorry, can I ask you something? Yes. Uh, why do you want a relativistic uh, invariance or? Uh, well, covariance because it's typically in a, in a holographic description of a quantum critical state, you do always have uh, holographic uh, relativistic covariance and uh, you, you typically have that this is, I mean, you always have relativistic covariance, but uh, you have uh, possible hyperscaling violation because you have this, uh, Entropy, which is not scaling like what you did before, or like um, as just using dimensional analysis. So basically, what this is what you find in a quantum critical holographic fluid, basically, and that was my. So I mean, just like just to understand what you are doing. So you're, I guess, you're constructing this hydro theory to describe the day that you were showing oh, before. Yes, exactly. So I mean, the relativistic covariance constraint is something that you find because the the, your energy current is related to momentum and charge by, by P minus mu J. And this is why you have this constant here. And this is because your equation of motion are covariant. Uh, can, can I just, I, I find a bit of a headache point, right? So um, it may enter in different ways, right? So uh, this is a relativistic covariant, but at a finite density, right? You consider finite density holographic setups, yeah. right? And then there's this issue of the fact that electrons have rest mass, right? And uh, there's this headache point that in holography, you cannot quite accommodate that fact. Mm -hmm. So uh, what you were saying here, is this resting on the masslessness of the degrees of freedom? Mm -hmm. And surely the final density, you know, is extremely dangerous to do. Uh, you may have an emergent Lorentz invariance at the zero density, uh, 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 fixed point, but... you know, because if you just just uh, set the row to zero from the beginning, you do have a yeah, but you're not supposed to do that. It's finite density, and we know it, it, it it's manifesting itself in, uh, in various ways. I'm just uh, saying that even if you are finite density, your equation of motion remains covariant. Yeah, but I'm basically asking the question whether that right the crucial uh, uh, deficiency of holography is that you cannot accommodate the finite rest mass of your. Uh, 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 UV degrees of freedom, right? Yeah, you assume them to be massless, right? So holography mm -hmm. may apply to, you know, graphene or something, but in cuprate, we know too well that the final address mass uh, matters a lot. I find a headache point, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, very well. Well, but the IR properties are, you can, you can. No, no, 
No, this is, it is really UV sensitive, you see. Mm, I'm not sure. I am sure about it, so long and hard about it. I find it the main headache point, actually, of the whole use of uh, holography. Mm. I'm just asking the question, right? Whether, whether you assume that here. I, I'm not quite sure because everything, you know, also find that trespass particles are relativistically covariant. But isn't this a statement about the uh, vanishing of the mass of UV degrees of freedom? In the UV, yes. Yeah, it, it, it's doing so, right? So, so keep it, keep your eyes a bit focused on it because here you can import, you know, uh, holographic pathology. I'm not sure about it how it uh, pans out, but for your very point. No, okay. The, the motivation was mainly holographic, and uh, but I also like to use holography, right? But it's yeah. be aware of, you know, that, that this is one. No, 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 it's true. It's true. I, I do agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, continue. You just uh, ask. Okay. So okay. So these are. The transport coefficients, so one thing that was actually known a uh, very long time ago was that the, the DC electric conductivity separates into two pieces. One is the some sort of what is called the incoherent conductivity, and one is which we call sigma tilde is basically related to all these uh, additional coefficients. Some of them are related to the charge order, some of them are related to the momentum dissipation. This is the usual drew the weight. The important piece that we found is that Basically, if you pack all this in this sigma tilde, the, the, all these transport coefficients are actually uh, very are actually um, depending on, only on four quantities, which are the incoherent conductivity, the this sigma tilde, the charge density, uh, the, I mean the density of carrier in the uh, and uh, the entropy. But as I told you many times, we have measured five quantities, so the system is sort of over constrained. So then uh, what we've done is just to play this simple game. We, we have uh, just uh, set the temperature dependence of the transport coefficients in a way, in the, in the only compatible way. And uh, in this way, we fixed some of, the, or some of the transport coefficients. So in order for the resistivity to be linear and the whole angle to be, uh, to go like T to the 1.5, the only way to do that is to have the resistivity to be dominated by the incoherent conductivity. Yeah, yeah, again, again, a point. I mean, this is a, again a cherry picking of data, right? So, in order to decide whether the uh, resistivity in the strange metal phase is dominated by the incoherent part or by the root part, you have to look in optical conductivity. Yeah. And I can assure you that optical conductivity is in a low frequency regime described by a perfect root form. Uh, so you can actually exclude that it's, it's due to incoherence. There's a reason that, you know, we have this story that, that, that goes back to 2014, right, where we, uh, together with Richard Deficit, where we blame it on the minimal viscosity. And the reason is, you know, you know, from optical conductivity, that the normal resistivity is coming from the root component. You measure it directly optically. DC, you cannot decide it. There's no way you can decide it. The only way to look at it is optical conductivity, and you cannot throw it away because your experimental friends are not measuring that. It, it's very well established, and that whole optical world will agree with this statement. Yeah, uh, but there's no but here. This is an absolute constraint on whatever you do. It's a long-standing problem. Uh, I tend to blame uh, uh, Andreas Kajk and Son Hartnell for putting this myth on on the agenda. But, but then, Jan, th there is no way you can have a different scaling in the whole angle, right? Uh, we don't understand that whole angle, excuse okay. me. Mm -hmm. We don't, I, I can tell you very few stories about it that highlight the mystery of the whole angle. Yeah, it's true. I mean, the, the also the uh, uh, Aristos, uh, Mike, uh, Aristotle's Mike Blake uh, uh, explanation right, of the whole angle is actually completely wrong on this basis. I was a referee, I overlooked it back then, but it's a large number of years ago. Right, so again, read our, I, I wrote recently that tutorial, you know, and it's precisely revolving around this fact that the DC resistivity, not the magnetic resistivity or anything of the kind, I don't understand that, but the DC resistivity is manifestly true. It's measured. It's not something that you make up. I mean, you read, apparently, you didn't quite read my, my, my tutorial. I, I, I'm explaining these, these facts out there and emphasizing them. 
I mean, you guys don't read it, you know, you are just, you know, doing a cherry picking and picking out some data that you like and you can fit, but storing away data that oh, are way more direct. But the resist resistivity is not really true, then. no, it's not. Oh, who's telling you that? Yeah, you can only decide that by looking at optical conductivity, no, no. Uh, dynamic uh, 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 data, and you have a perfect droop at low frequencies. I can show you plots, and I, I show them actually in the talks I'm giving. You guys are not listening, I think. No, but I, uh, of course, but in, uh, the point was that uh, you cannot really fit it with a droop. Who's telling you that? Who told you that? For instance, when it's off axis? Who well, told you that, 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 that is just folklore? I can show you pictures right where you really zoom in on the low frequency regime, where you perfectly see that the, uh, the uh, initial drop off as frequencies really goes like an omega squared. And, it, and, and you cannot distinguish it from a pure droop until you are at something like, uh, you know, what is it, uh, 50 MeV or something. That then is ingredient pieces kicking in uh, visibly. The whole optical world will agree with these things. You know, also we have theorists, but philosophy, all these people are saying it looks like a perfect good response. And you know, it, it, it's part of the standard interpretation. I mean, we are just going the mainstream of high TC stories about transport. Everybody has been saying, you know, it's very crude like. Would love to see it to be incoherent, but it's just not true. And it's a, it, it's just a myth that is propagating in your community. Uh. I'm sorry about it, you know, but this is the way it is. Okay, maybe. Yeah, Andrea, maybe let's, maybe you guys can discuss this at the yeah, end. Yeah, I'll discuss it later or whatsoever. Read my, read my tutorial because. Okay, okay. I, I, I will again. I mean, I, I still was going to. to maybe put the references in the chat then. <laughs> uh, read it, just read it. You know, you would do me a pleasure yeah? because then you won't fall in these traps. Good, good. Okay, let's go on, Andrea. Yeah, I mean, the end of the story was that basically, if you do that and you read back the the scaling of the nurse, you find a pretty well, pretty accurate description in the interval of temperature that we found that that we were before uh, estimating. <clears throat> uh, so, I mean, I think I, I was almost done. So basically. What we've done, even if maybe Jan was not really uh, agreeing with that, was to just to see if we can uh, fit some piece of data with uh, with uh, with the temperature scaling we had before. But uh, I do agree with Jan that uh, in order to, to to fit this data properly, you need the spectral measurement. Maybe you need the spectral measurement in the same uh, uh, to do this in the same to do accurate spectral measurement in the same crystal, or in, at least to be sure that you're in the same phase of the transport coefficients. So, so the best, the best uh, data on do behavior you have actually in single layer BISCO, which you also consider, and it's unpublished. I can show you that. Ah, it's unpublished. Yeah. It's so different from anything else, you know. Uh, it's basically nobody looks at optical conductivity except for Gary Horowitz uh, many, many years ago. You may remember that he was talking about a tooth peak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? So, but uh, our. It's not ecosystem, it's tenatology, you know, where you do serious holography, you find very similar uh, domination by the root. Yeah, maybe. It's unpublished, but where, where are these data when? Oh, you know, you can basically go back to, there are 10 to the power of three uh, data showing you optical connectivities. Uh, there hasn't been, you know, any disagreement that at low frequencies is due. You go to higher frequencies and you have these incoherent tails, right? And all the discussions were about incoherent tails. You can interpret them in a variety of ways, blah, blah. But everybody in that community took for granted that that low frequency is true. Only a lot of this came up with this idea uh, that's incoherent. Blame, uh, you know, uh, perhaps. Uh, oh, no, okay, but was that what Blake was... and later Kark and, and Hartmann. But what they were saying was, where are these data? Of everywhere. Hundreds of papers. And you guys don't look at it, it apparently. Unpublished. Optical connectivity data. They started to appear in 1988. Have, you have never looked at these things. You see these two peaks there and then long tails. Uh, okay. Ah. Well, okay, well, in any case. It's, it's for commu commuting for I know. 
leave my tutorial. I try to explain these things, you know. Okay, but if you mention unpublished data, how can I find it? In them? BISCO for the single layer BISCO for the highest resolution determination of a pure group behavior at low frequency ever. Right? That's really with an arrow bar that is five sigma or something. That is not published. Everything else is published. The fact that you see group peaks all over the place in the sense matter regime uh, has been a standard fact in uh, the ITC experiment community since uh, the uh, late 1980s. Okay, man, I wasn't. Uh, yeah, you guys are there. Yeah, I know. I tried to uh, you know, update you about experiment. I mean, okay, I did uh, some research, but uh, I, what, what optical connectivity paper did you look at then? Uh, for example, well, we and you see that so it's not incoherent transport when you're not in the uh, deep in the. Uh, so, so if I if I may interject, it, uh, at low temperatures, it's it's true, but at high temperatures, there are some. You're right. So you guys, at this point, right, that's when you go to very high temperature where you start to violate your radial, right, and you get this sort of you know fluctuating so sense wave like a sponge. I agree with that. I'm basically talking about. Low temperatures. Uh, Maybe this is this is the point where the 400 Kelvin in, in this metal and up to 40 Kelvin, you know, uh, at optimal doping when TC is at 40 Kelvin, that regime is all pure root. At high temperatures, it's deviating, right? And there you guys have a point. I agree. Yeah. So I, I don't know if this is where the discussion got hold up. Oh, this is all about low temperature data, uh, Blaise. I, I think maybe this uh, point wasn't very clear. I mean, I know that you met low temperatures. Right, it's basically, I just picked here where the blue line, you will agree, is, uh, I guess, literally like a dude, right? There's low temperature. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Say, yeah. At low temperatures, yes. Three. This, this is good uh, the spatial private data. Is. Look in the left panel, right? You see at the moment here, this is even setting in at low temperature, but you see at these lower temperatures, like during Kelsen or something, you see the sharp, what is it, uh, uh, rising peaks. That's not the best data. 100 is not already anymore, so blue there. I have much better data where you show that, where you see this, this uh, peak going, right? But it's, it's perfectly at low temperatures. So There's this omega squared cap, as you mentioned. Okay. You can even already find it in that famous uh, from the Marek from 2003 in Nature, right? With the conceptual uh, inquiry on teletile energies, where it, it's really, there's already a scanning collapse there showing, oh, it's really like a crude, uh, where the crude weight is temperature independent and the crude width uh, uh, is planking, right? It goes like one, what is it like temperature itself? But the fact that the Jude weight is planking, I mean, doesn't that make it a little harder to interpret as definitely Jude? You know, if, if there's an overlap no, with the no, conservative no, no, quantity, no, no, you'd expect no, a sharper. No, no, the, you, the, the, the analytic form is true, half a Laurentian, right? Uh, uh, when you have a half a Laurentian, you have a width, and that is uh, uh, the true width as related to momentum relaxation. Right? By definition, it has to be about nearly hydrodynamical, right? The momentum is nearly conserved because uh, the width of the peak is small compared to anything else at low temperatures. And then the total area under the true peak is the true weight, and that is then temperature independent. And these are all sort of classic oh, facts. Right? The tenor already make these cases in the uh, 1990s. Well, I read this, I mean, okay, regarding the true weight, how can you really be sure about the sum rules when your conductivity is not anymore true? Um, right, so the procedure is to say, uh, we see at low frequencies a perfect root behavior, and then you subtract the root from the data, and you see that there's an incoherent piece, except that the incoherent piece completely suppresses low energies. It, 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 it sort of goes up and then it tails down again. No. Okay. And then you have a true, true, true uh, weight, uh, the total area under the true part of your signal, and that is temperature independent. Okay, but when you, you cannot, I mean, regarding this panel it at 100 Kelvin or at 200 Kelvin, you cannot anymore use these sum rules. Why not? I have no clue what you're talking about. Of course you can. But, but okay, you, of course you can use some, some rules, but this- Yeah, you can. You can, there's no problem. I have no clue what you're talking about. I think you're not very familiar with optical conductivity. I'm, I'm, I'm basically repeating sort of a standard practice, right? Uh, so where you talk with so, so yeah, this being said, you know, Luca had a point in the sense that the, it's a bit disconcerting 
and it doesn't contradict anything you've just said, but it's a bit disconcerting that the optical conductivity at low temperatures can, can as you say, manifestly be well fitted, sufficiently low frequencies by a perfect Judah form, which suggests that somewhere around there's a, a quantity which is longer lived than everything else. Yeah. But at the same time, the width that you extract is Planckian. And, and usually you don't expect anything that lives at the place right. to be well yep. separated from other excitations. And, and right. that I get really frustrated because uh, Richard Davison, Kumar Schalm and me published a paper in 2014 that I, you know, basically... I know that paper on. extremely well, yeah. And so when you know that extremely well, you know, uh, all you need to know is that there may be a minimal uh, 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 um, uh, uh, viscosity out there that's explaining all of it. Uh, so a bit of a worry is, right, that uh, it's pending, uh, it's not universal, right, it's pending on a typical disorder strength, right, that, that shouldn't be temperature de uh, dependent and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, now it's not universal, but you know, the slope of the linear resistivity is not really universal at all, you know? Yeah. So, so there's plenty of room. So we have there basically a protocol saying when experimentalists measure all these things in the right way, we can prove it or disprove it. It's surely not disproven at this instance of time. Uh, so the logic is really what you say, right? So you see this nearly uh, conserved momentum, otherwise you wouldn't have root. <laughs> Right, and then the question is, why is that a, a, a moment relaxation time doing a planking job? Okay, there's one uh, a way you can explain it right, by assuming conformance to either two strange metal, right? And assuming the minimal viscosity and unfortunately assume that the uh, 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 disorder potential is not running as functional temperature, which kind of whatever you believe she is infinite, but you know, I'm worried about things like phonons and I'm really very worried about the guys the, the stuff you guys uh, decide at high temperature, right? That you, that you have this uh, more of a fluctuating sense wave like response. Right? That's really not explained at all. That's the way I view it. There's surely no doubt in my mind that incoherent really doesn't make sense there. Except when somebody can demonstrate that, you know, from incoherent, you can, you know, uh, we consider the pure dual behavior. But I guess you agree, it's very contrived, right? That, uh, you do all that hard work of making it uh, uh, incoherent, and then you have to do extreme fine tuning in order to get the right exponent. So that starts to wave like a good at low temperatures. I mean, it's uh, Occam's race. Discussion for another time. Maybe. It's another time, right? It's more like what are the uncertainties, what are the questions? I, I'm still basically agnostic, you know, I listen to these stories, but somehow. Uh, that root thing I perceive as first dogma. That's the first thing you have to explain. And there's a danger when you only look at DC uh, transport properties because you don't have the information to decide how it works. Uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I do uh, Well, I mean, I, I don't have anything else to say in general. Okay. Thank you for, very, very, for your attention. I'm still listening, you know, I'm not sure about it. And I like this incoherent interpretation. There's a lot more leeway as you. Uh, just argue right to uh, relate everything. Uh, well, let, let me thank Andrea first. <laughs> okay. Then ask. Uh, no, thank you, Andrea. Uh, thanks also for the discussions. Uh, let's see if there is any any other question. Uh, <coughs> Or comment. Yeah. Perhaps an invitation to push it further, right? Um, I mean, in some conductivity, you can still, uh, you know, try to subtract the uh, phonon contribution, similar for the specific heat. I mean, it's again the same to convince condensed matter physicists. The first thing you have to get right is the entropy, the specific heat. How is that? No. Yeah. What issue specific heat? Who cares about complicated uh, uh, magnetosomal transport things when you don't have the entropy right? Well, hydro give, doesn't give you any specific heat, no? I mean, it tells you about exponents, right? No, hydro, no. Maybe a log. But, uh, but you say incoherent. I mean, the sense of incoherent is different from right, the, the holographic job that you have a 
moment conserving hydro part and an incoherent part. The incoherent part is not normal hydro. Yes, but but you, you can't read the, the, scale, the exponent of a, the temperature dependence of a, of, a, of, a, of a specific heat from hydro. So this is what you miss. Yeah. So you need to... I have a question to you, right? So uh, I'm basically living in the universe of Andreas and Sean, right? Where you say, I blame the incoherent part. And then we know that uh, the, the scaling properties as function of blah, 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 are set by three exponents, right? The uh, uh, dynamic critical exponent, the hyperscaling uh, 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 violation exponent, and the charge exponent. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, you know also what the uh, entropy will do. That is the simplest thing. I said it goes like d yes. minus theta divided by c. So what is your theta? Or do you have a theta? Or did I misunderstand no, 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 no. your sense of incoherence? I do have, if you have this, you have a linear in T entropy. Uh, what is your Z and what is your theta? What if, it, what if I see that? What, what do you mean? No, you have the fundamental scaling exponents, right? The place uh, Edgar Stewie, we have scaling geometry. Mm -hmm. The hyperscaling violating exponent and the, ah, yes, uh, yes, yeah, yes. And the no, critical exponent. Ah, well. You have C to infinite is also constraint. We know that independently. You can get it. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You have Z to infinite here? Uh, well, this, in this little game, I didn't send it anything to infinite, but uh, this is what just I just read from the, from the data. But uh, yeah, I know. You know, it's, it's ambiguous. Right? Maybe, I mean, maybe, if maybe. I have to construct a, a solu an holographic solution, uh, yes, I think so. So you, you ex, ex, express these things in terms of uh, D, theta, Z, and charge exponent, just different codings. And I just ask, what do you find for these fundamental exponents? To mm. get a somewhat of linear in T uh, entropy, the only way I know is either take Z to infinite or take uh, uh, minus eta divided by c to be one, sending minus eta and z both to infinite. Yeah, I think. But you cannot get a linear yeah, t. I'm, I'm referring to, yes. And when you don't take a minus eta to infinite, you will run into constant entropy. That's also a constraint, it's not there. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I would say so. I am. Andrea, so when you, if I got it right, when you wrote this that we can see on the slide, you are not relying on having a holographic model. Right? No, 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 no. So you don't have, you don't even need to think what's the value of C, right? Um, you have to think something in order to get the scaling behaviors, you know? If you want to get these scalings from the way we know how to get them in holography. I have no clue what you mean is incoherent in pure hydro. I mean. Uh, but, but what do you mean? I mean, the, of course you have to, holography is basically hydro plus it provides you the, the scaling behavior for the, I mean, the temperature dependence of your. What is the meaning of the, is it now a question? What's the meaning of incoherent in your way of thinking? What do you mean with that? It's the particle hole contributions that you can have in relativistic hydro. Ah, what the meaning of incoherent is the yeah. is the part that doesn't depend on the on the dissipation. Uh, I mean, it's the part of the conductivity that doesn't really change if you. If you shift omega to omega plus i gamma, uh, that is uh, no, it's not fundamental. Right, so I would say you have the momentum conserving part, mm -hmm. right, and uh, that we better call do it or something. Um, and then the specialty of high of 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 uh, holography is right that you have the incoherent part, and to make statements about it, you need. Uh, uh, in your finite density state, uh, a system, all I know is that uh, you have the scaling geometries, right? And, and it uh, gives away very general scaling laws. That again, you know, Andreas and Sean put that in a sort of a right perspective. It, it's sort of, it, uh, just telling it your particular form of scaling out there. Mm -hmm. 
and 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 then the, the exponents you see in transport whatsoever are associated with these underlying exponents are you doing that or are you doing something different can i, can I interject <laughs> yep please uh, go it, it, incoherent means anything which is not strictly galilean invariant this is this could be my definition any departure from strict Galilean invariance means that the current can be transported by stuff that doesn't drag momentum. And the only, the only fine, fine definition where this does not apply is a system that are strictly Galilean invariant. Because in that case, J is equal to P up to some number. Yep. And that's it. But as soon as you break Galilean invariance, whether there are no boost invariants at all, or whether you go to relativistic or Lipschitz boost or whatever, then you will have some incoherent component in the sense that I tell you to find it for a dragging momentum. Place, but the question still uh, continues. Uh, what is then uh, the stuff doing the incoherent bit? Is that like the typical sub bosons, or is it either right the, the, the scaling geometry businesses that we learn from holography? Uh, so, well, if I if I think about quasi particles, if I think about starting from quasi particles, it means that, for instance, yeah, let's not do it. We start from We start from particle matter. Let's not do fast particles. It's too easy. It's it's about this, right? It's just, just to the point. Uh, it's not about definitional thing. It's just how are these uh, exponents computed? Is that using scaling geometry business, or is this rooted in the this pseudocol stone uh, business? What is precisely going on here? Uh, he, he is using his hydrodynamic theory, yeah. matching the DC transport coefficients predicted by the hydrodynamic theory to the scalings that they observed in experiments. This yeah. is how he fixes the scaling exponents. Yeah, but I learned in order to, to grab that incoherent part that you don't see, you know, a normal across part of the hydro, blah, blah. You had always to rely on the, the scaling geometry systems that, that, that came from you. But they don't apply here. I just asked the question, oh, what, what, what's the meaning of this? Uh, no, you but don't data, you don't make it up, but it's coming from somewhere. I mean, if you send eta to infinity, you find a solution where the incoherent part is going to, to linear in t and the entropy is going to linear in t as yeah. well. But are you using that? Do you have etas and, 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 and I'm not uh, I'm not using the, the solution, but uh, there is a holographic solution doing that. I know, but I'm asking what you are doing. How do no, you? No, I'm not. I, what I'm doing is what Blaise was saying. So uh, where is it in the equations? Uh, right. So what I've well, seen is if you space the pseudocons are both on business, you need to input their information to get the scaling loss. What is the information you're inputting? No, you need to. to, you need to oh, I, I don't have no clue about this. You need to measure the spectral. You need to measure the conductivity, the spectral conductivity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that I, I, technical I question. It's a very simple technical question. Are you doing what uh, Andreas and Sean did? Rely on the scaling geometry, so you get scaling loss from it for the incoherent part in that sense, or are you doing something else? Uh, right? I know it's not telling you that. I, I think scale, you need extra data. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I know that I need extra data. So but what is it? Sorry? But what is it? it should it cost about sons? Question mark? Yeah, that's, that's what I don't know. Well, Andrea, I think you, you will agree that at this stage, in this particular slide, mm -hmm. there's nothing that tells you where sigma tilde is coming from. No, exactly. So that there's was no it. direct evidence. No, no, no. no Any no. pseudo Gaussian physics on this slide. No, no, no. He's I, trying to make a case that you should split the resistivity into two pieces, one coming from a so-called incoherent piece, sigma zero, another one from some sigma tilde, which represents coherent physics, but whether pseudo-spontaneous breaking of translations is present here, doesn't just, there's no way to tell from this. No, no, not, not, not that. So we shouldn't get fixated on this. No. Then whether he can extract from this scaling exponents, well, that in principle you can, you make scaling assumptions on you know, what the dimension of sigma zero of n and all of that other stuff should be. And, and there, there has to be some kind of microscopy place. Uh, sure. 
Sure, but he's not going to answer that, any yeah? microscopic questions. I have a hydro hole with holography. And I don't get the answer. I, I, yeah, just I know, but that's because that. he probably doesn't know the answer. Because but the, he's done something to compute it. What was it? No, he just wrote down some hydro theory and matched yeah. the scalings observed experimentally. That's it. There's nothing microscopic here. Can I, can I, can I ask something? Because uh, I mean, there is a story that is confusing me. Can I see the constitutive relations? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Andrea, you left your presentation. I mean, yes. No, I mean, I've been like trying to ask these things since like long ago, but uh, yeah, there was like like this, one. like this long discussion. Yes, I mean, something I'm confused about is that a priori, when you, so you are saying that your resist the longitudinal uh, resistivity, the rho x x, is the inverse of sigma zero, but a priori, that's not true until you solve the hydro equations. So you have to assume something in order to get that the yes, longitudinal okay. conductivity is one over sigma zero. Otherwise, it's just something combining all the transport coefficients you are putting in your constitutive relations. If you get, I mean, the full story is this one. Uh, if you get uh, the full uh, DC conductivity is sigma zero plus the sigma tilde, which is this one, which is the exact uh, zero, I mean, leading uh, in order in magnetic field result. And the omega, so, and then omega one and omega zero are? Uh, additional transport coefficient due to, I mean, is the coherent part, the, one, the part that depends on either the, the charge order or the dissipating mechanism, whatever you find. Okay. So, so, no. so my question is simple. I mean, let's, let's I think I understand it, but you need, extra, you need extra data to uh, tell us how the incoherent part, right, is not related to, to, to either the momentum conservative part slash the, the pseudocol, some bars and blah, blah, how that is depending a priori on temperature. I have no clue. How this is depending on magnetic fields. I have no clue. You have to make extra assumptions out there. That's not hydro. Let me. So, so, so hydro needs first that input before you can uh, start to talk hydro. Wait, let, let, it's let's also that all know. systems will do this, right? Yeah. I mean, let's, let's, let's answer Jan, Fran's question first. Uh, well, Fran, are you, are you done with your question? Um, well, yes, I was just like trying to understand why the, the, the resistance was just one over sigma zero and not no, uh, something is, combining the rest of the transport coefficients. This is an additional assumption mm -hmm. based on experiment. But it, it, it depends on the rest of the transport coefficients. Yes, 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 right? yes. yes. I mean, but he, in that slide, he was just writing rho x x equal to one over sigma zero. No, no, no. This was an additional, it's the only way I found to fit all angle and uh, resistivity. Otherwise, okay, it's, same. Okay. It's, but okay. You know, in, in pure hydro, you it does depend on anything. And if you, this is all, only also the leading order in the magnetic field, because if you just keep the exact solution is, is a huge, just a huge expression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that, that I know that's the reason I was asking you, how did you just like uh, no, 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 fix no. the thing, it, which were the assumptions? I, I first expanded the leading order in B, and this is reasonable because B is typically small here, and then I did the other additional stuff. So why is you is a stiffity okay. proportional? Okay. Thanks, uh, Andrea. Yeah. Why is you you is stiffity? I, I just get to I try to get a very basic uh, information about what is done here. Why is you is stiffity uh, linear in temperature? Why? Uh, in which sense? Why? I no, I see that. Let me some right. it. Huh? And you know. Uh, since uh, uh, 32 years or something that linear resistivity has been obsessing people because there's no easy explanation. It's not like because we have hydro, we have a linear resistivity. Come on, that is not, not the story. No, there has to be an assumption there telling you why there's a highly anomalous linear resistivity, linear temperature resistivity. Why is that in your computation? No, in, in, in my computation, you can't really tell uh, what, uh, how the resistivity be scales in temperature, just, just computing stuff. Yeah. But, but Jan, if I understand well what, what, what Andrea is doing, he doesn't want to claim that linear in T comes from hydrodynamics. He wants just to claim that basically the full set of coefficients is compatible with the hydrodynamic theories using, nothing else. 
But, but then I have again a headache, right? Because it's, it's of course, world famous that there's this whole angle. And when you try to interpret this in a simple, you know, real simple hydrodynamical way, there's two theory, right? And uh, uh, the, the, the uh, whole relaxation time should be the same time as for the linear resistivity. Right, that is simple hydro state, but so what are you doing, right? That, that, that is no longer true. Uh, why not? Because the whole world would be amazed that you can just pull this out of just straight hydro, where you just say, I, right, so the usual argument is, right, you have a simple root system, and when you do this cross part, very obvious, and we apply a magnetic field, right? You can, you can decide to orbits and the path of the electron gets longer. And we assume the same relaxation rate for the momentum of the electron. You get your standard result, right? That your whole relaxation time and the linear momentum relaxation time are the same thing. And your whole angle is no longer uh, doing weird stuff. But, but where is this extra data that you have telling that these things can be different? But whatever, whatever you measure, if hydro is a core TFT, you should find something compatible with hydro. If not, yeah, but I'm telling you that uh, the whole world has been believing since uh, I think 1956 or something that you understand the whole angle business based on real minimal hydro. It's just saying, you know, we have a single moment of relaxation time out there. And at the same time, that pairs is the cyclotron frequency being responsible for all magneto transport phenomena. Mm. So you do something extra out of QE, but I was a you to everything over. Just don't get it. Just don't understand it. I'm not sure I agree, but. Uh... No, this is standard knowledge. It's not my opinion. You, It's about you having to explain to the world what you do different. And I ask a simple question the world would ask. I mean, what I did was was Matteo was pointing out. I don't know. I, yeah, I think a level of confusion here. Maybe let me. Yeah, it's confused. Yeah. Andrea, Andrea is not deriving the scaling. Eh? You are not deriving the scalings in temperature. No, no. Right? So if Jan is amazed that you are getting those scalings, for instance, from a. I'm just saying, standard uh, understanding of hydro is telling that the whole relaxation time and the momentum relaxation time should be the same thing. And then your whole angle is there. So what is happening here that is different? Question mark. Uh, well, in some sense, uh, I do have one. I mean, uh, since I packed everything in the Sigma field, I do have one uh, relaxation rate, which is basically what is in Sigma field, whatever it is dominating here. So, uh, but you let your uh, linear uh, transport to be incoherent. Yeah. The magneto transport knows about the root sector and the pseudo pulse and boson, blah blah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, this, I mean, on this, I can be agnostic because I, I, I don't have any additional input to say what is dominating. Yeah, I, I, I kind of see it. Right? You basically say here that linear stiffness is sigma naught and your whole angle is sigma tilde. Why is that? Most people doing transport would say, I have no clue. No, no, no. I mean, this is, a, I mean, once independently of what you, this is the, uh, okay, the assumption is that sigma naught is dominating the resistivity, but the fact uh, that- Oh, you just assume that, right? And yes, yeah, and the, they basically yeah. say, I have enough uh, data the, that I, I I'm kind of complete yeah, yeah. The fact that the whole angle goes like that is, uh, is not an assumption, it's just, uh, that uh, I mean, the exact formula for this is uh, this coefficient in front times something that is uh, almost equal uh, uh, numerator and denominator is good, so is order one. So the only assumption is this one. This one is not an assumption. Uh, of course, it's an assumption. The whole world would say no, 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 no. In normal systems, right, it's the same sigma naught that would enter the uh, the the, the uh, uh, whole angle formula. No, I. Yes, no, the whole world will say that. That's an assumption. Why, why should there be a sigma uh, triggle? Why, why is that? Because if you, if you derive just the complete formula, uh, you find some, I mean, I don't have this here, but you find something which is these coefficients, uh, what, what is it? This one times 
a function which is order one, so it doesn't have any, it doesn't scale in temperature, in whatever you, whatever you say for the scalings. So this is not an assumption. The fact that your whole angle or your whole scattering is different from your linear momentum scattering is a big assumption also in hydro. Yeah. No clue what you're talking what, about. What I'm saying is that the fact that the, the, the whole angle, the, the scaling of the, of the whole angle is, de is determined by this quantity is not an assumption. Why not? It's just the formula that tells you that. Which formula? Uh, the hydro coefficient. I can. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, yes. That's surely not the case. I mean, that's the whole origin of this whole angle puzzle. No, I disagree. I disagree. Uh... Uh, is this applying to normal systems? A normal thermal liquid system, they also give into hydrodynamic principle to a degree. And I can assure you that this is complete, you know, nonsense out there. It's the same sigma wiggle everywhere. This is special about, you know, magneto transport in that sense. It's just a longer path for the electron. Yeah, special about the magneto transport. I mean, no, 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 no. This is a puzzle. So there's something in your hydrodynamical consideration. That makes it different. And I'm even listening to it, but I want to know what it is. Now that you have your whole, the whole world is sort of telling you, no, no, no. Uh, you, you're assuming here what you should explain. Uh, perhaps you have an explanation. That's what I, I'm trying to get out of you. No, but uh, I mean, maybe I'm probably not understanding what you what you ask, but I repeat this. this have, you, have you read all that literature from the mid 90s about people worrying about the whole angle? Yeah, but. When what? you have done it, you know that you should have a story here explaining why there's a sigma wiggle there uh, in tau, uh, tau H and a sigma naught in rho X. It's violent in simple, simplest form of, of hydro. It is. Uh, I mean, I think this is hydro. This is just hydro. I mean, there is a, no, it's, it's not. It, it's hydro plus uh, extra assumptions you make, and I don't know what they are. That's what I'm asking. Uh, I. I I, I would disagree. Andrea, it's, it's hydro modified to include the pseudo Goldstone, right? No, 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 no. No, no, no. That's all the same. It's still, you know, like the thermal liquid hydro. Maybe it's worthwhile now to go carefully through this process step by step yeah. so that we're sure everyone agrees. So, first we go through the constitutive relation. Yeah, that's what I was trying to Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait. Let's, let's go through it step yeah. by step so we don't agree. Yeah. So, first we go to the constitutive relations. We all agree that we can solve these constitutive relations. Where do you see the magnetic field in these uh, relations? Ah, it's in FRJ. It's in, uh, it comes in the equation. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Okay, good, fine. So we all agree. Now we solve, do the martin Kadanoff with those equations as they are and determine the finite frequency response of the system. Yeah. Okay, no issue, okay. Now we take the DC limit of those expressions and look at the small b as well which is what Andrea does on the next page. Right, so it should basically stay here. Uh, 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 uh. Right, so when I open, I try to start to read it. Right, so when I, I omit everywhere the incoherent part. I mean, yeah, you see. When I, now I ask question about how it works. Omit everywhere the incoherent part. And now I compare the magneto resistance and the linear resistance. I think I get back to usual business, right? It's like a sigma naught cube divided by a sigma naught squared. Wait a moment, sigma naught is the equivalent <coughs> part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you see here in the whole angle, you see that yeah, it's the same business, right? It all hangs together. And it's really about how you balance or what you think is uh, due to the dual part and what's due, uh, due to the incoherent part. Yeah, I mean, the, the whole angle here you see is uh, this coefficient in front times a function that cannot scale in temperature because it's mostly the same. You know? Yeah, yeah, but it's all deal, right? That, um, again, it's about how you perhaps outsmart the standard views. Right, in the standard view, there's no incoherent part. There's only sigma wiggle. Yes, yes. Right, and when, when I have my eyes focused, sigma wiggle, of course, out everywhere, sigma naught. 
I think you get back what I was just arguing. Yes. Right? That is basically like the magnetic field means that the uh, currents have to traverse a longer path and therefore uh, uh, you get magnetic resistance, etc. But I think the crucial uh, part is really that you have this incoherent part on board. Yeah. Right, I'm just asking a question, I didn't get no answers. And then it turns out uh, that when you have that, mm -hmm. um, right, let's, let's look at the raw exactly. You just say, oh, I believe that Sigma Wiggle is not doing anything out there. And then you go to the whole angle part. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see that actually, uh, when you try to uh, cross out sigma wiggle, you get there a divergence. That's horrible. That's what basically set by the uh, uh, coherent part. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah, and that, that makes sense. You know, it's uh, this is basically what I was asking. What to. they say. I mean, I, I believe this. Yeah, this of course all the issue is. Uh, no, I mean, paid, yeah. just just to be clear now, so yeah. everyone's on the same page. If that's all right. So now we got to this stage with the DC conductivities. I'm going to speak for Andrea and then he can correct me in a second. You put in T scalings for each of these quantities and then you compare to the data to see what matched. Yeah. And then you get my devastating remark that the, we know that the linear stiffness is very crude. And then this whole thing collapses somehow, except when you can find another uh, loophole. Guys, will you go through this computation? I'm gonna stop the recording and just yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm basically set. You know, I think it's interesting to see this. I haven't quite realized it. No, no, it's interesting. I'm not yeah. trying to. Uh, I'm just uh, saying I will stop the, the recording. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy. I, I just wanted to know how it works. Oh. Uh, the, the big problem that I see is another is that basically you are hiding everything.